Uh, what you doing with that? I'm watching a brick film made with LEGO Studios. Okay, and what's LEGO Studios? You don't know what LEGO Studios is? No, I mean, wasn't somebody supposed to have made a comprehensive video about it by now? Oh yeah. Well, let's not waste any more time. Make yourself comfortable, because this one might take a while. Everything we have covered up to this point can be considered brick filming prehistory, as it has almost all been discovered and documented long after the fact. From here on out, the history we cover will have made a more widespread impact as it occurred. The single most important contributor to spreading the concept of brick filming to a wide audience was the release of the LEGO Studios Steven Spielberg Movie Maker set in November 2000. Before we get into that, let me explain the circumstances that LEGO were in at the time. In the late 90s and early 2000s, the LEGO group were on the downturn financially. Fearing they would be left behind in the toy market, they were launching many new themes to see what would stick. This was leading them to experiment outside of their comfort zone with short-lived themes such as the doll-oriented Scala, the Kinex clone Zap, and the much maligned Galador, which defies explanation. In particular, LEGO were concerned by the growing popularity of video games and computers in the home, and feared that their traditional toys would become seen as antiquated. They began efforts to combine LEGO and technology, releasing LEGO-based video games and LEGO themes that incorporated computer interaction, such as Mindstorms. With LEGO Mindstorms and your computer, you can build and program robots that do what you want. Like capture special family moments. Forever. Uh, that was weird. Yes, let us swiftly move along, and never speak of this again. A concept that came about under these circumstances was to create a LEGO product that would enable people to make their own movies with the aid of a computer. This would have been a rather novel and unproven concept, as there was little in the way of existing toy products to compare it to, and there was also very little visible brick filming activity anywhere at this time. It demonstrates how LEGO desired to get ahead of the curve, and find success in new and uncontested markets. Members of the design team had seen some LEGO stop motion, which helped influence the direction of the project. In order to help develop and market a LEGO Movie Maker product, LEGO wished to establish a partnership with an inspirational filmmaker. Their top choice was Steven Spielberg, and so a meeting was set up to present the concept to Spielberg. Since the mid-90s, Spielberg had already been thinking about creating a toy product with the goal of introducing filmmaking to kids, but had never gotten around to partnering with a company to develop it. Now that LEGO were pitching a similar idea to him, it made for a natural fit, and so he agreed to partner with them. It was only the second time that Spielberg had lent his name to an entertainment product, following the rather rudimentary movie-making PC game Steven Spielberg's Director's Chair, from 1996. In May 2000, LEGO officially announced the LEGO Studios Steven Spielberg Movie Maker set, which would facilitate the creation of films using stop motion and live action. This kit would include a webcam with LEGO compatible housing, software for image capturing and video editing, a booklet with tips and tricks for filmmaking, and of course, LEGO bricks. The software was created in collaboration with Pinnacle Systems, the creators of the Pinnacle Studio editing software. LEGO announced that all of Steven Spielberg's profits would be donated to the Starbright Foundation and the Shoah Foundation, two charities he was involved with. The LEGO Studios Movie Maker set was to be the flagship set of an entire new LEGO theme, with a wave of additional LEGO Studios sets planned to follow. The Movie Maker set was scheduled to officially release in North America on November 1st, 2000, at a recommended retail price of $179.99. LEGO were obviously hopeful that this new type of product had a potential to become a huge hit, and afforded LEGO Studios about 50% more advertising budget than the average launch of a new LEGO theme. The first public hands-on demonstration was presented at E3 2000. Later in the year, there were demonstrations in toy stores across North America, beginning shortly before the set was officially released. Promotional materials for LEGO Studios incorporated footage from an original brick film called Dino Cop. The campaign included a TV commercial appearing to show the film being made with LEGO Studios. There was also a 30-second trailer for Dino Cop that was shown before films playing in theaters, and the full two-and-a-half-minute brick film was only available on the LEGO Studios website, where it premiered on November 1st. Dino Cop was intentionally created to resemble how you might create films using LEGO Studios at home, featuring lots of live-action puppetry in addition to stop-motion animation. 
However, as you might expect, it was not actually shot using LEGO Studios webcam. We did some tests with that, but it was a little too difficult to like rack focus, and that was also shooting at like 400, so the pixel was so primitive, so that if it went on a bigger screen, it would fall apart. It was basically just for you to use at home and to be able to watch it at home, you know? So in order for it to go out to the rest of the world, what we did is we found a little video camera that had a higher quality chip in it, but we reproduced the same lens size so that we didn't cheat too much in terms of what you could pull off with the LEGO people in making the movie. Notably, the advertising for LEGO Studios allowed for the rare opportunity for a TV commercial in the United States to depict LEGO moving by itself via stop-motion animation. Ready for my close-up! We had been doing all the LEGO TV commercials, but because of the strict rules on toys in the United States, we could not do a TV commercial for broadcast that had the characters animated. Unless you could do that with the product, but with LEGO Studios, you could do that with the product but not for the other commercials. So every time we shot all the commercials for Lego, you know, a hand had to be pushing something or, you know. Sometimes the best man for the job is a dinosaur. Alongside Dino Cop, the studio's website also showcased the short brick films Jewel Quest and Jurassic Bark. While only running around half a minute each, these films demonstrated impressive technical qualities and remained well regarded for years to come. Both of these films were included with the Movie Maker set on the software CD. It is understandable that promotional materials had additional factors requiring them to be created more professionally, but it still must have come as a surprise to some people to bring the Movie Maker set home and discover that films created with it came out looking like this. Yes, something I must get out of the way now is the most infamous characteristic of LEGO Studios. Picture quality is terrible. The camera produced a rather grainy image and didn't reproduce colors very accurately. These shortcomings became more pronounced if you didn't have a lot of light in your frame. However, it wasn't just the quality of the camera itself making the films look this poor. When shooting with the studio software, frames and video were captured at a resolution of 320 by 240, but when a finished film was rendered, it underwent heavy compression and was reduced down to a paltry resolution of 160 by 120. It is likely that the films were so heavily compressed so that they could be emailed to friends, as was suggested for you to do. However, even at this quality, the file sizes were relatively high for the time, owing to LEGO Studios saving films in MPEG format. A possible explanation for this decision could be that MPEG was widely compatible and required little CPU usage to decode and play back. The studio's camera has often been given all the blame for the low quality results, but when it was used in conjunction with different software, the results were comparable to what you would have gotten out of other webcams from the year 2000. With that out of the way, let's take a look at everything included with the LEGO Studios Movie Maker set. The set contained over 400 LEGO pieces with elements to create a film set. The main structure was a street scene that included play features to make it appear as if an earthquake was taking place. Other elements included some micro-scale city props, a T-Rex, and a large-scale T-Rex foot with stomping action. There were also builds of behind-the-scenes equipment plus film crew figures, included in part to encourage kids to consider the behind-the-scenes filmmaking process. The set came with seven minifigures in total, including a director figure modeled after Steven Spielberg. Two cardboard backgrounds were included to serve as backdrops in films. Another element to aid in filmmaking was a brick-built mount for the camera, which allowed for easy tracking movement, tilting, and turning. Some of the LEGO elements used were specifically designed for this purpose and made their debut in this set. As for the camera itself, it actually contained innards created by Logitech and is internally the same as the Logitech QuickCam Web from 1999. On the outside, the camera featured a manual focus ring, a capture button, and a built-in microphone. The same design of camera in a different color was also included with the 2000 LEGO Mindstorm set Vision Command, and sometimes people would use the Vision Command camera for brick filming. The LEGO Studios set included a handbook with the instructions for the set, as well as a surprisingly insightful guide to filmmaking. Lastly, the set included a CD-ROM containing the animation and editing software. The software was only designed to be compatible with Windows 98. 
Also included on the disc were resources to use during editing, such as overlays used for effects, as well as a library of sound effects and music tracks. The sound effects in particular were often utilized by early brick filming community members, some of whom continued to use them after they had upgraded from the studio's equipment. Stand by to roll. Last but not least, the disc included seven example brick films, which were professionally created and not actually shot with the studio's camera. Clips from these films were used in a series of 21 tips and tricks videos on the disc, which explain basic concepts as well as how certain shots and effects could be achieved. This T-Rex looks gigantic. If you put it behind the mini skyscrapers and shoot the scene with the camera looking up from below, how do you make a vehicle move all by itself? It's easy when you use stop motion. The Brick films themselves were mostly parodies of Steven Spielberg films, and also demonstrated some of the then-upcoming additional LEGO studio sets. The films were produced by the Danish studio Bastrup Trick Film, whose collaboration with LEGO dates back to the 1980s. It includes the various in-store promotional Brick films that we covered previously. The studio's films would be Bastrup Trick Film's final collaboration with LEGO. A line of additional LEGO Studio sets was officially released in North America on January 1st, 2001. Although lacking the camera and software, these sets generally were each centered around a moving action feature which could potentially be incorporated into a brick film. For example, the set Moving Backdrop Studio featured a motorized scrolling mechanism and two printed paper backdrops, which could be used to create moving backgrounds in your films, and the set Explosion Studio was rigged so that a push of a lever would cause the building to dramatically fly apart. The sets doubled as general movie studio theme playsets, as they also included crew minifigures and models of film equipment. The LEGO Studios Movie Maker set and the additional sets were released in the rest of the world between April and May 2001. Action! With LEGO Studios now in the hands of the public, people got to work creating what in most cases were their first ever brick films. There exist many examples of largely similar early studios films featuring mostly only the elements from the Movie Maker set and simple stories usually involving dinosaurs. Needless to say, it wasn't long before people started incorporating LEGO from other themes and their own original creations into their studio's films. And this is my new crocmobile. Isn't she a beauty? In comparison with more modern brick films, films created with LEGO Studios were often a hybrid of both stop-motion animation and live-action footage, as the set encouraged. They also much less commonly relied on dialogue and voice acting, or portrayed speech through subtitles alone. When creating animation with the LEGO Studio software, the frame rate was locked at 7.5 frames per second. While this doesn't hold up to the standard that would soon emerge, it was acceptable when compared to most other brick filming efforts around before it, and was especially decent for a product marketed towards children. The video editor included separate channels for footage and texture effects, plus two channels for audio. This may sound primitive, but keep in mind that it was still more channels than the later Windows Movie Maker. The LEGO Studios Movie Maker set was the recipient of awards including two BAFTAs for interactive media. In addition to the primary audience of kids, the forward-thinking technological aspects of LEGO Studios also garnered it some sales from adults, including from some who weren't regularly buying LEGO at the time. People could submit their finished films to the LEGO Studios website, and some were chosen to be made available to watch in the screening room section on the site. For the lucky few who were selected, it was usually the first time one of their brick films was made publicly available online. And in addition, the screening room would have also served as the first place many other people would have ever seen brick films at all. What the heck? The screening room section later also featured some professional brick films unrelated to LEGO Studios, including works by Spite Your Face Productions, and the White Stripes music video fell in love with a girl. Also, the LEGO website received the addition of a Studios-themed shockwave game called Backlot in early 2002, which was especially noteworthy at the time for being a three-dimensional open-world browser game. The game was developed by Templar Studios and received industry awards. Oh, we're in 2002 already? This is moving along okay. No, 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 that was just a tangent. We still have more to cover from the year 2000. The box of the main LEGO Studios set featured an advertisement for an official LEGO movie making contest, which is especially notable as it was the first ever brick film contest. 
However, it was not quite the first ever video contest hosted by LEGO. Earlier in the year, the March 2000 issue of the LEGO Mania magazine announced the LEGO Maniac's coolest home video contest. The stated goal was for entrants to create a video recording, showing, and describing their coolest LEGO experience, and featuring an original LEGO creation. As was to be expected, many of the entries took the form of a kid displaying and describing one of their builds, but this contest becomes relevant to brick filming history because all three of the winners turned out to be narrative-based films. Additionally, more than half of the other 47 finalists were also brick films created by people of all ages, and usually featuring stop-motion animation. Among the finalists was a teenage David Pagano, a brick filmer who would go on to create classic brick films such as Little Guys and Playback, and spend many years producing promotional animations for the LEGO group. The film I made for the coolest home video contest was a film called A Day at the Races, I think, and I actually haven't seen it in a long time either just because it only exists on VHS tape. I think I did the audio digitally and then like kind of played the video from one VCR and the audio from my computer and recorded it into my VHS camcorder and that's how I kind of made the master, I guess we could call it. And this is just like my own weird like kind of hobbyist tendencies, but I was always interested by VCRs as a kid. And I was always interested in sort of the, the sort of patching of cables to either like do editing or get different effects or dub in new audio. All of that is stuff that doesn't really come into play anymore because everything is so self-contained in a cell phone or a tablet or even a laptop. Um, but at the time it was a lot of kludging together different pieces of technology that didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily supposed to work together, but you made it work because you had to. The film A Day at the Races was kind of more akin to the kind of films that I think the Lego filmmaking kits that they put out now, it was kind of more similar to that where it wasn't really stop motion. It was mostly me kind of puppeting figures. There's definitely something that's always funny to me about just kind of like doing this with like a puppet. Like something about that, like you, it's its own sort of brand of funny that I think is something you can't really capture in... It's not even, even a matter of being able to capture it in stop motion. It's more just like knowing as an audience member or a viewer that like all that is is someone just doing this with like a puppet on a stick. Like that's very funny to me. The home video contest was followed later in 2000 by the North American LEGO Studios Movie Making Contest, and this contest was of course specifically for film-based entries only. The Studios contest was advertised in stores, in the LEGO Mania magazine, on the LEGO Studios website, and on the box of the Movie Maker set. LEGO established a partnership with the Los Angeles-based Backyard National Children's Film Festival, and it was initially stated that winners of the North American Studios contest would go on to compete at the Backyard Festival against winners of an international LEGO Studios contest held online. The North American Studios contest had a deadline of March 31, 2001, and it is evident that the widespread promotion was successful, as the contest reportedly received over 700 entries, which even to this day ranks among the very highest entry counts for a single brick film contest. Nine finalists were selected, split evenly between the age brackets of 8 to 10, 11 to 13, and 14 to 18. Notably, the contest did not require you to create your entry using LEGO Studios, and only three of the finalist films were actually made with it. But where are the other two? Among the finalists, once again, was David Pagano, with his film Haunted. Hey, here comes Stuart. So what do you guys be for Halloween, hey? I had a different reaction to it the second time around, where I was like, oh, they're doing another one of these contests. Now is the time where I can really kind of step up my game and make an actual stop motion film. So Haunted was like the first film that I really sure used it. a stop motion piece of software to do the animation and to make the shots happen. Even though A Day at the Races was only a year cool earlier, like technology at the time was still, there was like a disconnect where like I wasn't quite there yet, but not just me, like technology just wasn't quite there yet in terms of what was 
um, affordable and accessible to everyone. So with Haunted, even though I was shooting using stop motion software, I was still using the same VHS camcorder that I had used to shoot all of my films prior to that. It's just that instead of pressing the record button as fast as I could, I was actually just using the composite out of the VHS camcorder as a way to get a feed, like a live video feed into my computer. Um, I didn't use a webcam because I had actually received the LEGO Studios kit for my birthday once, uh, plugged it in, set it up, tried to get something going, and then realized, oh, this is way lower resolution than the VHS camcorder I was already using. It's bizarre to think about it, but it was a step back for me where I was like, oh, this is, this is like really minuscule now. Um, so I ended up returning the, the Studios kit, even though there were some cool parts in it. Are you guys sure we're allowed to be here? It was definitely one of those things where it's like you don't know what you don't know. So at the time, like I didn't think about the fact that, oh, I don't need to make the inside of the haunted house the same model as the outside. And it was more just like I liked doing that kind of building at the time. And so I had built this haunted house around Halloween and then kind of started tinkering with it uh, from a stop motion perspective kind of after that. Like I'm, I, I've got this model. Let me just kind of have fun animating little vignettes and then later when this contest came up it was like okay well now I've got these vignettes I've already done this work how can I stitch them together into something that's uh, coherent and the reason that it was finished in March is because I think that's when the deadline for the studio's contest was you know in thinking about it now it was kind of more similar than not to the stuff that we've done at Pagonimation for the Lego group Without even knowing that my career would even lead anywhere towards that, it was already kind of me just using a film as a way to show off a Lego model. to get some sleep. Submitting Haunted to the, the Studios contest, I remember I was using a capture card to get the VHS camera feed into my computer, and I think the only way I could get the films then out of my computer was hey, to kind of do the reverse and use the capture card to play literally the the view of the monitor out through the composite cable and it back into the VHS camera. If you look at the copy of Haunted that's on the studio's contest tape, it's like both letterboxed and pillar boxed. Like there's just like a big black box around it and that's because that was the limit of the resolution that I could scale my computer up to, to spit it back out to VHS. So what, what that film is to me and what I actually sent to LEGO are, are kind of not exactly the same thing, just in terms of like the visual presentation of it. Like I'm very, now as a filmmaker, I'm very concerned about, oh, what, what I put out to people, I, I want it to be exactly what I intend. But at the time, that wasn't possible. The nine finalists and their families were invited to an awards ceremony at the theme restaurant Planet Hollywood in New York, where the films were screened and a winner was chosen from each age bracket. The awards ceremony occurred in June 2001 and was modeled after a Hollywood premiere, with guests arriving by limo to a red carpet flanked by photographers. A press crew interviewed some of the finalists and received some truly insightful responses. I really have no idea about what's going on. Because I was older and I have two younger brothers, you know, getting out of the limo at um, Planet Hollywood, I think everyone who was there, like in terms of like press and PR, they all thought my brothers were the winners of the contest because, oh, Lego, it's kids. Yeah, so this, we gotta take photos of the kids. Um, so consequently, I think there's like maybe a half dozen photos of my brothers at this event, and I think one photo from me, and that's the photo that I've used in a lot of stuff like the Brick Journal article where it's like me getting out of a limo looking like some sort of awkward Richard Nixon for some reason. The prizes for each winner included the entire LEGO Studios product line and a brick-built trophy modeled after the director minifigure. The ceremony was hosted by guests known for television work. The girl who was in the Pepsi commercials of that era, I believe uh, Hallie Eisenberg was there, as well as some sort of monkey or chimpanzee. I legit don't remember any sort of simian. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't remember interacting. I don't remember seeing 
Don't remember that. The winning film in the 8 to 10 age bracket was Where Does All the Lego Go? which follows a group of minifigures who build a helicopter to escape from their distracted human owners. Uh, the tower's gone, the yeah. guys are gone, yeah. the parrot's there. The 11 to 13 bracket was won by the film Ale Alien Hunter, which is the only winner that was created using Lego Studios. What are you doing in my house? The 14 to 18 age bracket was won by an excerpt from a film called Adventures in Legoland, featuring flight sequences and original music. This is it. It's now or never. All nine finalist films were made available to view on the Lego Studios website, and a film that became particularly well remembered by the people who saw it from here was Maximilian and Truth, which still stands out to this day for its brick built puppets and large scale sets. Maximilian and Truth, like, that was a film where it's the kind of film I would have liked to make sort of stylistically in terms of, you know, obviously if you're familiar with my recent work, I am very inspired by kind of old Lego builds from the model shop and things from store displays or Legoland, all that kind of like brick built stuff is, is very much my, in my wheelhouse. But I do remember being like, there's some neat builds in it. It was just, I think, beyond sort of what my Lego collection contained at the time in terms of uh, quantity. Your Majesty, can I speak People sometimes ask me if they're familiar with Maximilian and Truth, if that was like an influence on little guys. Um, and not really. I think they both kind of draw from the same well of, oh, like model shop models are cool. Like what if there was a film like that? But I think I think certainly like anything with Pagano puppets, like uh, country building or playback, like those those kinds of films feel more spiritually similar. I think, and Maximilian Truth also has like a lot of just you know live action shots of like doors opening or pulling things on strings or whatever. So there's also that sort of stylistic similarity. The three winning films from the North American Lego Studios contest went on to be screened at the Backyard National Children's Film Festival in November 2001 but the originally intended plans for the Global Movie Making Awards mostly fell apart. It is evident that the International Studios contest was never carried out, and in the end, the only other brick films added to the Backyard competition were two films which had been winners at a German youth film festival in a special category sponsored by Lego. The Lego Studios Movie Making Awards was initially referred to as an annual event, but ultimately never took place again. There were, however, a couple of other localized and self-contained LEGO Studios contests held in 2001. LEGO Singapore partnered with the Singapore Environment Council to run a contest for brick films with an environmental theme, and they supplied the LEGO Studios Movie Maker set to schools for students to use to create entries. There was also a United Kingdom LEGO Studios Movie Making Contest, for which information is scarce, but two winning films have been located. TBC News, and the remarkably titled Heavenly Balls. Shall we get him out? Nah, come back from there. The winners for both of these contests were made available to view on the LEGO Studios website. Let's distract him with a flash. Um, not that kind of flash, Ed. Next, uh, what were we talking about again? Um, at some point this was about a LEGO line. I assume there are more sets to cover? Oh yeah! Further studio sets released in 2001 included a group of four very small vehicle sets as a budget option, and also a variety of small promotional polybag sets that were usually given away in conjunction with another product. Two of these polybags even contained an exclusive minifigure of the Nesquik mascot bunny, which nowadays commands a relatively high price. At this point in history, with the existence of IP-based LEGO sets still a recent phenomenon, it appears that LEGO might have considered using studios as an umbrella theme for sub-themes based on new films, if they were to be shorter live lines than the likes of a Star Wars or a Harry Potter. In July 2001, LEGO released two sets based on Jurassic Park 3, as a sub-theme of studios. 2002 saw the release of two LEGO Studios Spider-Man sets, to tie in with the release of the film. 
A third studio Spider-Man set, based on the wrestling scene from the film, was planned, but the decision was made to cancel its release over internal concerns that it did not fit with the LEGO group's values. It was stated that these sub-themes could be used in conjunction with the LEGO Studios Movie Maker set to recreate scenes from the films, and another tie to studios was that the sets included some film equipment builds and crew minifigs. However, the main builds were more general in their designs and less specifically geared toward inclusion in brick films, and these sets aren't particularly commonly seen in brick films created with LEGO Studios. Later Spider-Man sets from 2003 and 2004 did not carry the LEGO Studios branding. The largest and best sub-theme of LEGO Studios was a line of four horror movie themed sets released in mid-2002. Each set featured a different classic movie monster in minifig form, and these figures were particularly unusual and cool at the time. Studios Horror were among the first ever LEGO sets to include dual-sided minifigure heads with two facial expressions, which would prove very useful for brick filming. In hindsight, Studios Horror struck a better balance between being good LEGO sets and being beneficial for brick filming. The focus on a particular film genre and inclusion of archetypal characters and related props and scenery proved more useful for brick filming than specific action set piece sets that might only be useful for one scene in a film. This can be observed in the relative frequency of the use of Studios Horror sets in brick films created with LEGO Studios. Welcome to my cafe. A CD containing additional sound effects to use in your brick films was included with the largest Studios Horror set, Scary Laboratory, as well as with one of the LEGO Studios Spider-Man sets. This CD also contained a couple of original brick films created by Spite Your Face Productions, who were the LEGO Group's go-to collaborators for stop-motion material from 2001 to 2004. The two films, which were also made available on the studio's website, demonstrated the 2002 LEGO Studio sets and the new batch of sound effects in use. The first animation was comprised of less than a minute of loosely connected shots featuring Spider-Man and the Green Goblin. The second was more substantial and with greater structure, a two and a half minute film titled Scary Thriller, featuring elements from all four of the studio's horror sets. LEGO requested that the film resemble something you might be able to recreate at home, so Spite Your Face intentionally did not create it to the height of their abilities, but the film still came out impressive for the era, with its colorful lighting and unusual custom scenery. This was actually the second version of Scary Thriller created by Spite Your Face. The previously created version differed considerably, as it featured entirely different events in the second half and it was generally darker, with some of the shared scenes even containing different footage with darker lighting. This original version featured some very impressive shots, with the centerpiece being a huge crane shot that moves from the mad scientist's tower all the way down a hill while reanimated skeletons emerge from the ground. In a rather cautious move, the LEGO group rejected this version of the film over concerns that it was too scary which led to the creation of the second and final version, featuring a lighter tone complete with an ending in which everyone has a dance party. The original version was later released on the LEGO Studios website for Halloween 2002 under the title Scary Thriller, Director's Cut, and LEGO even provided a warning that it might be too scary for some. The original version is generally considered to be the superior film by those who have seen it. Studios Horror may have been pretty cool, but by this point, the writing was already on the wall for the LEGO Studios brand. No further LEGO Studios sets would be released, and the theme was quietly discontinued. The LEGO Studios website went offline in early 2003, though some of its pages and the backlot game were retained elsewhere on LEGO's website for a while. Overall, LEGO Studios was not exactly the smash hit that LEGO hoped it had the potential to be. The Movie Maker set was considered to have sold decently well in North America, where it received the greatest marketing push, but worldwide sales were considered disappointing. This was particularly unfortunate when taking into account the unusual additional cost of translating all the included materials. It is possible that LEGO Studios was released a bit too early for what it was trying to achieve, given where technology was at the time, but considering the inherently niche appeal of brick filming, it possibly would have seen similar results even if it had been released a few years later. LEGO had hoped they could establish a product you could continuously purchase useful add-ons for, 
but soon discovered that it was a bad business model to hope that kids already owned a near $200 set. The more specific to brick filming an additional set got, the less it would sell, leading to studio sets hitting the discount shelves. The studio's project leader, John Sellerts, later expressed the opinion that the additional sets lacking the camera ended up being really nothing special. The only additional set from the first wave that shows up in brick films with much frequency is the exploding bank. After multiple experimental misfires during this time period, it would ultimately be a back-to-basics approach which would return the LEGO group to financial stability. However, the greatest lasting impact and influence of LEGO Studios has nothing to do with the LEGO group's finances. The release and promotion of LEGO Studios was the first time that the concept of brick filming was shared with a widespread global audience, complete with the angle that it was something which you could do yourself at home. Previously, relatively small numbers of people would either come up with brick filming by themselves or sometimes be introduced to it from some much more obscure source. But now, if you were paying attention to LEGO between 2000 and 2002, chances are you would encounter the idea. The Movie Maker set was released right around the time when personal computers were becoming much more common in family homes and sharing videos online was slowly becoming more achievable, making it the perfect timing for LEGO Studios to play an instrumental role in fully establishing brick filming as a hobby. Although there had already been some online discussions of brick filming and a small number of brick films being shared in places, it would be in the wake of LEGO Studios that an online brick filming community would really begin to grow, and a centralized location for brick filming activity would be established. Less than two months after the initial launch of the Movie Maker set, Jason Rowald created the website BrickFilms.com, which became the main gathering place for the brick filming community from then until 2008. Jason, having already had the desire to create LEGO animation, bought the Movie Maker set upon release, and began discussing the use of it with other adult fans of LEGO on Lugnet. On December 16, 2000, he launched BrickFilms.com, coining the term brick film in the process. The site featured a film directory with links to brick films available around the internet, and it also included a message board for people to discuss LEGO filmmaking, in part owing to Lugnet's absence of a dedicated section for the topic. A community of brick filmers started expanding centered around brickfilms.com, and many of the early members were creating their brick films using LEGO Studios. Ambitions soon began to outgrow the limited technical capabilities of studios, and by 2002, most community members were upgrading their equipment, or else were starting out using better equipment to begin with. Here are a few examples of what some of the early community members were making with LEGO Studios, with each followed by something the same person would go on to make in 2002. How lucky. Come here. I'm a mummy. I scare people. Watch what happens when I walk up to somebody. I'm a mummy. <laughs> LEGO Studios would continue to see some use mostly by outsiders into the mid-2000s and even into the early years of YouTube, but if the people using it in these times then made their way to the community, they would soon be advised to upgrade their equipment. Here we are, filming with none other than the LEGO Studios camera. That's it. We're getting a new camera. I'm looking for a QuickCam Pro 4000. Ah! I finally got the QuickCam 4000! <laughs> Although the community were quick to move beyond the Movie Maker set, LEGO Studios had still played its part in helping to influence the establishment of a major online presence of brick filming activity in the first place. I don't deny it. That's interesting. So should I check out that website nowadays? Absolutely not! Brickfilms.com was the other key player in firmly establishing the hobby of brick filming, and the site has its own completely separate rich history during this time period, which we will cover in the next installment.
the task of the Considering that the site had a mostly adult and teenage user base, averaging older in its earlier years, it is worth reiterating that the primary audience for LEGO Studios was children, who usually weren't particularly engaged with the internet. While plenty of kids played around with studios for a brief period of time but subsequently stopped brick filming, there were others that started out with studios who would continue on with the hobby, or else would remember it and return to it after a number of years hiatus. Some such brick filmers remain active to this day, and some have gone on to work on brick films commissioned by the LEGO route. Here are a few examples of an early film followed by a more recent film by some of the notable brick filmers who created their early works using LEGO Studios. He would think to me by putting me together. Alright. That's a puffin on holiday in Paris. <clears throat> Let's try this next one. It's... It's, uh... It's, uh, um... So since I'm a super burned sheriff, why don't you become like me? And together we can make the West a better place to be. Super burned sheriff, super burned sheriff, he's a super burned sheriff born in Kentucky. Whoa. This guy's got a freaking bear trap in the bathroom. Paranoid much? This is Chris's, and here's yours. Wow, thanks! Not Legos. Nah, just some glass I found on the ground yesterday. You see? Spider-Man's a menace! On a related note, there have been people who owned LEGO Studios as a child who would go on to careers in filmmaking or related fields. Wow, I haven't even finished filming it with... What's the gas on? I just felt the bump. It's on E4. Extremely full. Another major influence of LEGO Studios is that many people who never actually used the movie maker set itself would take up brick filming with other equipment they already had or subsequently acquired as a direct result of the release and marketing of LEGO Studios bringing to their attention the idea of creating brick films. At the time that Studios came out, I think the internet was not what it was today, obviously. So I think the people who were already brick filming had found each other on the internet, but there was also a giant swath of potential brick filmers who I think hadn't even considered... This is, this is something that comes up in both my classes and in talks that I give or speeches or whatever, whenever I'm at LEGO events, there's invariably someone who, who expresses something along the lines of, I never even thought about using my LEGO collection to do this. And that's that's gone down over time because it has become this more pervasive thing, especially with things like the LEGO movie. Again, like it's more out there in, in just like the pop culture consciousness. And I think that was definitely the case with LEGO Studios, the original like product line. It was definitely this thing that spoke to an audience that hadn't even considered doing that kind of thing with their LEGO collections and sort of introduced them to this concept and I think started a lot of filmmaking careers probably. My name's Kevin Ulrich and I run the YouTube channel Brotherhood Workshop. Um, I basically started doing Lego animation when I was 11 years old, did that for two or three years, took a break from it for about five, six, seven years. I picked it up again when I was 23, and it's been going really well. I've been contacted by uh, Warner Brothers, by the Lego Group, and by several other smaller companies that have commissioned different videos from me. When I was 11 years old is when Lego released the Steven Spielberg Movie Maker Kit. And that's really what got my interest in doing stop motion with Lego toys. And so I mowed the lawn for my dad every week all summer. He paid me $10 every time I mowed the lawn. And eventually between that and my other chores, I had saved up enough money to buy that kit. And once I had enough money, my dad said, eh, 
if you, if you just pay me that much, I'll just sell you my old Handycam instead, because it'll be a much better quality camera. So that's how I got started in LEGO animation. Uh, I wasn't very good to begin with, as you can imagine, but thankfully I didn't realize how not good I was, because I thought everything I made was gold. Oh my gosh, it's moving, it's awesome, I have a lightsaber battle. So I had the encouragement just from my parents, from my brothers, and just from my own excitement at seeing something come to life that I just kept moving forward. Again, we're talking like three to five frames per second brick films, just as fast as I could hit the record button on my dad's camcorder. Are you doing the ambassadors from Tr Supreme Chancellor Valorum? In retrospect, I started seeing how much I had improved, but again, I'm glad I was blind enough not to see, wow, this isn't very good, because then I would have been discouraged and given it up. But now I'm where I am today because of that. I always tell people that w the studio's contest was the first time that I felt like filmmaking could be something that I could make into a career. You know, before that I had made lots of tests, I had played around with toys. I always talk about it like playing with toys in front of a camera, which to a degree is still kind of what I do, but um, I think before the studio's contest it was definitely more of a flight of fancy where I just kind of did it as like a pastime and not really I didn't really think anything about it but to be able to put a film together to build a set and make these little scenes and have a coherent storyline and put it together for a deadline and have people actually recognize it and say oh like this thing that you did has value um, not that I derive the value of my films from what other people say about them but again it was kind of something I had never even thought about the value of my films before, so for me, the studio's contest was like definitely a milestone in my own career. Uh, even though it wasn't a career yet, the, the studio's contest was kind of telling me, oh, like may maybe see what else you can do with this filmmaking thing. See see what kinds of opportunities it might bring up, and pay attention to which parts of it you do and don't like, and and see where it takes you. In summation, LEGO Studios ended up being a great success in perhaps unforeseen or unintended ways, and is one of the most important things to happen in brick filming history. In comparison to previous installments of this history series, we haven't discussed many individual brick films, as the main relevance of LEGO Studios is more in its overall influence than the individual films created with it. Most of the best films from this era were not made with the Movie Maker set, and we will cover them in the next installment. This does not mean to suggest that there weren't some great brick films created with LEGO Studios, and I would like to finish things off here by highlighting a small handful of standout Studios brick films. The LEGO Chainsaw Massacre was a well-regarded brick film in early 2001, and demonstrates how horror brick films could make effective use of the Studios camera's look, with the color palette and grit seeming to add to the atmosphere. Big Night Out is a comedy brick film released in January 2002, which is much more reminiscent of the popular style of brick films from a number of years later, and is a pretty funny film in its own right. Watch the master make his move. Hey there. Hi, what can I get for you? How about your phone number? Excuse me? I said a chicken salad sandwich. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. You must have mistaken me. No, no, you didn't. You asked for my phone number. So... Can I have it? No! Can I just get my sandwich? One by Y is an action comedy brick film created using a limited supply of Lego in which the characters are Lego plate pieces, and the film became a source of influence for later non-minifig brick films. It was filmed with the Lego Studios camera, but was not captured and exported with the Studios software, allowing it to have a higher frame rate and be in better quality than the average Studios brick film. Batman Revenge is a notable early Batman brick film which predates official Batman Lego and features some well done set design and cinematography inspired by the Tim Burton Batman films.
Resident Evil is another standout horror brick film that uses the studio's camera to achieve a moody, nighttime look, and it also features remarkably early usage of inset lighting in a brick film. Spider-Man Born to be Wild is a little-known brick film with surprisingly impressive web-swinging scenes and micro-scale shots, which are seemingly made more convincing as a result of the terrible studio's picture quality. This discussion would not be complete without mentioning that the longest brick film ever made, The Wars of Darkness, was created with LEGO Studios, and runs for a truly daunting four hours. I will. Farewell, my friends. This film actually makes for a good watch under the right circumstances, and includes enormous and creative battle sequences, as well as impressive sound editing within the confines of only having two audio channels to work with. The film was far too massive for the studio's software to be able to handle rendering it as a video file, so the film had to be saved by playing it in the editing preview while recording the screen with a DVR. This was ultimately to the film's benefit, because it is not as heavily compressed as films rendered with the studio's software. At the time of its completion, The Wars of Darkness was far too large to be shared over the internet, and it was instead sent out on two DVDs to a number of people who requested it. It was eventually uploaded to YouTube in 2012. And for the final film in this small roundup, last but certainly not least... Hello, welcome to this year's fart competition. Woo! Woo! Dave, you're first. Okay, Dumbledore's next. Well, that seems like as good a note as any to end this on. Make sure to come back next time when we tell you the full story of the origin and early years of the online community. Sure, and in how many years will that be? Let's aim for less than one. But I make no promises.